Welcome to the opening convocation of the 2021-2022 academic year. And I speak for everyone here, I'm sure, when I say it is absolutely thrilling to be here with you in person. So welcome. <clears throat> Our, our first order of business is to have our land acknowledgement, and I would like to call on Tamara for Ravello, if she would, to please read it for us. Yale University acknowledges that indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohegan, Manchantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Shattuck, Golden Hill, Palagasset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac, and other Algonquian-speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. The Divinity School recognizes the role that Christianity played in colonization movements and repudiates the use of Christianity or any other religion for the purposes of oppression. We encourage all to work for justice in the aftermath of colonization and to reject racism and anti-indigenous attitudes in all forms. Thank you very much, Tamara. As Dean of Yale Divinity School, it is my honor to welcome you to this, the 321st year of Yale University, the 200th year of Yale Divinity School as a distinct unit within the university. And if you're wondering, 200, yes, and we will celebrate it, not this year, but after we finished our 200 years and hopefully are past all the restrictions of this year, so we'll do that next year. But we embrace Andover Newton Seminary in its sixth year at YDS and 215th year, Berkeley Divinity School in its 50th year, we note that, and that will be noted this year, uh, at YDS and its 168th year, and the Institute of Sacred Music in its 49th year at YDS and 94th year. We welcome all, whether you are live here, and it's wonderful to have such a good group, or watching via live stream. T.S. Eliot wrote, what we call the beginning is often the end. And to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. Today, we mark the end of a year and a half of virtual or hybrid interaction and return to in-person interactions. We are making an end and we are making a beginning. Our beginning will not be without challenges. The pandemic is not over and we'll have undoubtedly some adjustments to make as we work our way through the year. But for the moment, May we all bask in the glow of the smiles, even if they're under masks, and the radiance that comes off the faces of one another. It is really good to see people, even if only your foreheads. During the summer, we have been joined by two new faculty members, Professor Folker Lapine and Professor Braxton Shelley. And as part of our custom, it's a form of hazing for faculty who join us. We invite them to participate in the opening ceremony. And so today, Professor Shelley will deliver our address. I will introduce him properly in just a minute. And Professor Lapine will offer the benediction. Professor Lapine comes to us as the Horace Tracy Pitkin Professor of Historical Theology. To say that he has an outstanding publication record <laughs> is the understatement of probably the month. Uh, 
He is the author of 19 monographs, the editor of 11 editions, the editor or co-editor of 49 books, and the author of more than 335 scholarly articles. So if you take his class, don't complain about a 10 or 20 page paper, please. Uh, but he is internationally famous. We're very thrilled to have him on our faculty. We're also joined by seven staff and I don't know if they could all be here, but I'm gonna give you their names. And if you're here, would you stand up? Or if you're standing in the back, would you wave your hand just so we can recognize you? I know some of these are here. Jaquan Beecham, who's the postgraduate assistant of Andover News. Right over here, Jaquan. Graduated last spring. Lisa Kenny Bajwa, who's student services coordinator. And I don't know if Lisa is with us or not, but it's great to have her in our number. Bill Craven, who's a senior financial analyst. He's back over here in the blue shirt, waving to us. I see Bill. Kit Keeley, who is the director of student life. And I don't know, he's still working for another school at Yale, SOM. So he's probably down there. Rod Lowe, who's a senior associate of major guests. Rod, right back here in the dark blue blazer. Great to have you with us, Rod. Michael McEnlintel, and many of us know Michael, who is the liturgical coordinator, and Michael is with us right over here. Yeshide Peters Peterson, who is the new Associate Dean of Berkeley Divinity School. Yeshida. We are thrilled to have you one and all. The largest group of new people is, of course, students. We have 112 new degree seeking students, 63 MAR, 38 MDiv, 10 STM, and one non degree seeking student. 41% of you are from underrepresented groups. You heard me correctly, 41%. That's the largest number to ever enter Yale Divinity School. You range in age from 21 to 72, but you're beat last year because there was a 16-year-old in the group last year. 37% of you already hold advanced degrees. You join a very robust group of students who, like all of the new students, are virtually coming to the quad for the first time themselves. With the only ones who have been here previously are the third year MDiv students, and that feels like a long time ago when they were here. We will reinvent our traditions as a community uh, in all, we have 327 students, so that's your student body this year. One tradition that we want to maintain is to recognize the students who welcomed all of you, all three years of you, to orientation. This year was particularly challenging because the format was changed multiple times as health conditions changed during the month of August. So I would like to ask them, if you would, to please come forward when I call your name. And if and there are five of them, if you just hold your applause, let's get all five of them up here. And then let's give them a roaring round of applause. Uh, for BTFO 1.0, Jamal David Neal. Jamal, please come up. For BTFO 2.0, Mark Dingler and Natalie Owens Pike. Please come forward. For BTFO 3.0, Alexander Dreyer and Elizabeth Searcy, if you would all come up. <laughs> you survived BTFO. They work very hard and very creatively. There are two staff that we want to recognize for what they've done in the last couple of weeks. 
First, Jeannie Peloso, who ran all of orientation. Jeannie, would you please come up? And, and with her, I want to invite Lynn Haversett. If you have eaten any meal in the last month, it is because of her work. She has handled all the logistics. So Lynn, please come up. We're fortunate today to be joined by the president of the Student Council, Mary Inga, who will read the scriptures. Our speaker is Professor Braxton Shelley, trained at Duke and then at the University of Chicago, where he earned both his MDiv and his PhD in music. Professor Shelley comes to us from that little school up there in Boston by the Charles River, Harvard. <laughs> where he was the Stanley A. Marks and William H. Marks Assistant Professor of Music. His first book has just appeared, Healing for the Soul, Richard Smallwood, The Vamp, and The Gospel Imagination. And a second one is on its way, An Eternal Pish, Pitch, Bishop G.E. Patterson and the Afterlives of Ecstasy. He has one of the most unusual records of anyone I know. He published an article entitled Analyzing Gospel, which won the major award from all three of the major musical societies. It won the 2020 Yap Kunst Prize from the Society for Ethnomusicology. I skipped one. The 2019 Adam Krims Award from the Society of Music Theory and the 2020 Alfred Einstein Award from the American Musicological Society. To win one of those awards is a major coup. To win all three at the same time is virtually unheard of. Braxton comes to us and will be speaking today on the life of the mind. But before he comes, I'd like to call on Professor Joyce Mercer, the Horace Bushnell Professor of Practical Theology, and pastoral care, and the newly appointed de Associate Dean for Academic Affairs to turn us towards God. Please pray with me. Spirit of life, spirit of love. We give you thanks for your presence today in this glorious earth that we steward. You who are all compassion, all mercy, all justice, and all love. We pray for your blessing on us as we gather this day to open the new semester and school year. Shine your light of love on Yale Divinity School and on this university as the new semester begins and our work continues. We pray especially for students, those returning to campus and those who step onto this quad for the first time, for their families and supporters and all who have made it possible for them to be here. We pray in thanksgiving and hope for the coming academic year that all will be blessed by the learning that will take place. Oh God, in a world desperate for those who can bring energy, intelligence, imagination, and love to a broken world, we pray that the teaching and learning that happen here might matter, nurturing joy, not only in the lives of our students, but in the ministries and work they will carry into places of need. We pray for faculty, staff, administrators, asking for your guidance and care in all that we do to make this a place of learning, light, and life. 
For those among us happy to return to campus, glad to be among friends and colleagues again, we celebrate and we ask you to bless that joy and keep us all safe as we gather. For those returning with some uncertainty or fear, we pray your compassion and your protection. Many of us struggle with the constantly changing situation as we adapt to new information, trying to keep this place both safe and working. Spirit of life, spirit of love, guide decision makers with wisdom and empathy for all those experiencing stress from the continual changes we face. Among us are many who have suffered the loss of loved ones from COVID or other losses and struggles. Comfort the grieving with your presence and empower us to care well for one another. Spirit of life, spirit of love, we pray your healing touch upon all who are sick, whether from this virus or other malady. As we work together this day, open us to become more than we are already. As we consider the ways that white supremacy and racism infect the world in which we live, including this divinity school and university, we confess our need for your help to bring change. Some among us have long borne the effects of these distortions in humanity. Others have lived in practiced ignorance of our own complicity in the harms of racism. Guide us, God of justice and mercy, toward equity and renewed community, that our academic work might not be empty effort, and that the lives shaped here by education may be part of your work to make all things new. Spirit of life, spirit of love, we give thanks for the possibilities you put before us on this opening convocation day throughout this semester and year. And so it is that we offer this prayer in your holy name. Amen. A reading from the prophet Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and God brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. God led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. God said to me, mortal, can these bones live? I answered, oh Lord God, you know. Then God said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied suddenly there was a noise, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then the Most High said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal and say to the breath. Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as God commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. 
Then the Most High said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord, the word of the Lord. Let me begin by thanking the Reverend Henry L. Slack, Dean of the Div School, for this bit of hazing. <laughs> Let me thank my new colleagues and each of you for your attention. Now let us pray. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope let my will be lost in thine. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's a real risk in praying for your will to be lost. Sometimes God will take you up on your offer. And uh, so with that in mind, I hope you don't mind if I offer a message slightly different from what I had planned. Still coming from Ezekiel's 37th chapter. In the ninth and 10th verses of Ezekiel's 37th chapter, you find the following words, which were so ably read. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded. And breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. From these verses and from those that preceded, consider the following thought. A prophetic community. A prophetic community. A holy and haunting kind of convocation took place in the mind of a prophetic thinker holy because it brought together a prophet and the divine, haunting because it drew both down into a valley, a valley filled with bones. There in the valley, a voice named Ezekiel attended to his surroundings before getting enlisted in the work of revival. This work was prophetic because it required Ezekiel to speak on God's behalf to the bones and to the wind. This strange assignment to speak under the influence, to wear another's authority, made Ezekiel an instrument of the impossible, an agent of the improbable. Because he prophesied there before his eyes, a heap of dead, dry bones became a living, breathing army. So much had happened since the last time these bones were together. So much had transpired since the last time this militia stood in its own strength. Reunited though they were, the same they could not be. Too much had taken place for them to be unchanged, unmoved, or unmarked. Too much power had been visited upon them for them to become what they had already been. The miraculous return of these forgotten fragments then was not really a return at all. Instead, it was the incarnation of something better. It was a holy and haunting kind of convocation. What, what is the meaning of this astonishing assembly, a meeting that traversed ontological divides between humanity and divinity, between the living and the dead? 
What lessons can be lifted from the path traveled in this prophetic vision? And what does all of this have to do with us and with this our opening convocation? I'm glad you asked. As I meditated on what transpires between the prophet, the bones, and the Lord, I've come to see this vision as a window into the prophet's understanding of his vocation, his view of the role he was to play as a mouthpiece for the sovereign Lord, a calling and ministry defined by the very fact that it was not about him. This vision of long, dead, dry bones coming together on an ancient battlefield, it shows that Ezekiel saw himself seated at the center of a transcendent conversation functioning there as a conduit of spiritual power, working like a vehicle through which flowed wisdom from another world. Ezekiel, this so-called son of man, felt called to be both a mortal minister and the pillar of a prophetic community. I come and suggest that we can learn a lot from Reverend Ezekiel, that Ezekiel's self-understanding can be quite instructive for us today as we gather to sanctify the work we will do together this year. Ezekiel's vision aims to teach us that if dry bones can become a living army, then we can be better than what we might otherwise have been. Among all that we might choose to be the many things we might want to do, Ezekiel's holy and haunting convocation shows forth as good a model as can be found. It offers a few valuable lessons about what it takes to be a prophetic community. First thing to note, a prophetic community must be willing to encounter ugliness. Prophetic community has to encounter the ugly. Uh, the lesson teaches that Ezekiel is taken up by the hand of God, carried out by the Spirit of God, and set down in a valley, a valley full of bones. While its gruesome contents are transparent, from the moment he enters this valley, this first glimpse is not enough. For the same holy power that drew Ezekiel out into the valley seems dissatisfied with mere presence. Text says that the spirit makes him walk all around the valley, taking a full accounting of this macabre scene. In so doing, Ezekiel discovers that there are very many bones and that the bones are very, very dry. These two intensive observations show that very many had lost their lives on this ancient battlefield and that their remains had been disgraced by abandonment for quite a long time. I'm interested, my friends, in the gratuitousness of all this. Note now that it is not some diabolical force that makes Ezekiel tarry with the bones. It's not some evil spirit at work here. No, it is a holy spirit. Text says the spirit of the Lord. I'm gripped then by the prophetic necessity to look at the bones, to stare at the bones, to count the bones, to walk among the bones, noting well their quantity and their quality. This encounter with ugliness is the first movement in Ezekiel's prophetic path. And this text teaches us that those who aspire towards a higher kind of community have got some bone counting to do. And it doesn't take much vision to identify some of the bones that litter the landscapes of our individual and collective lives. I mean, just look at all the hate, all the ignorance, all the greed, and all the corruption that courses through the veins of this society. Then you'll see some dry bones, and that's ugly. Look at all the racism and sexism and xenophobia and homophobia and transphobia that sustain the inequity of so many institutions. Those are some dry bones, and that's ugly. But the ugliness is not just out there. It's in here, too. For as this divinity school reckons with the legacies of white supremacy and whiteness in this country and its universities, it is sure to encounter ugliness. Because that's what reckoning means. That's what reckoning requires in this text and in our contemporary context. Encountering ugliness is part of what it means to be prophetic in this season of crisis, in these deadly conditions when death has become so mundane. There's too much bone counting to do. 
And what is true for the institution is also true for the individual. Because if we're honest about it, there's some ugliness in and around all of us. And if this community does its job, you will encounter it. You'll have occasion, seminarians, to think critically about your strategies for handling stress and dealing with difficulty. You'll have occasion to analyze your family history to trace all the trauma that grew on your family tree, and you'll need to do it so you don't mix up your bones and the bones of your future parishioners. Yeah, you'll encounter the ugly if you do div school the right way. And that's a good thing. It's a kind of vision that testifies to intellectual and spiritual maturity. So let's be like Ezekiel in pursuit of prophetic community. Let's get ready to look at the bones. After Ezekiel encounters the ugliness all around him, then he needed to endure uncertainty about them. He had to endure uncertainty. After Ezekiel counts the bones, then God asked the prophet a question. You know it, son of man, the King James says, can these bones live? Mortal, can these bones live? Which is to say persons susceptible to death, can death be undone? I love this question and all such questions, moments when God asks a question, when omniscience poses an interrogative, raising an inquiry that points past the answer to a deeper kind of revelation. You know, the kinds of questions like, Adam, where art thou? Like, where is your brother Abel? Like, what is that in your hand? Like, do you want to be made whole? You, you can always be sure that something significant is afoot whenever one of these questions shows up. And in our lesson, this is an absurd question because of where they are standing. The question is not about reviving a recently dead person, but about resurrecting a vast army dead so long that the remains had become fragments of terminated life. Bones picked clean by scavengers, bleached white by the sun. These are the things that the divine asks a question about. But although the prophet was well versed in the miraculous, well acquainted with the astonishing, although he had already started to foretell the restoration of a divided and defeated nation. He didn't assume that he had the answer to this improbable question. When God said, uh, can these bones live? Ezekiel said, oh, sovereign Lord, you know, which is to say, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm impressed, Brother Dean, by this response, by this refusal of assumption. While the very fact of this vision might lead you to expect revivification, the prophet doesn't jump to this conclusion. Instead, Ezekiel shows a willingness to endure uncertainty. Unlike the PROFIT prophets who are always equipped with cheap predictions of commodified prosperity, Ezekiel practiced prophetic humility. And we can learn from all of this because Prophetic humility is about surrendering to the source of power rather than claiming wisdom that is not your own. Through this humility now, Ezekiel models a better way to handle authority. And we got to pay attention to that here because whether we seek it or others project it, being on a campus like this will make many think that you are the authority. And while authority is fine, while competence is needful, certainty ought not be the goal. It's better to get comfortable with uncertainty because the disciplines practiced in this quadrangle, they're not secret boxes of answers so much as they are enduring sets of questions, an evolving set of methods, an ever-adjusting set of lenses through which to learn and practice and transform our traditions. The path through this place for students, faculty, and staff should give us not firmer dogmas, but it should help us to ask better questions. If you want to know the truth, I used to look down on Ezekiel. I used to wonder why his extravagant vision and infinite imagination was so shaken by this valley that he didn't seem to be so sure about what could happen. 
But, but Ezekiel has helped me to, to endure uncertainty. Now more than ever, I've got way more questions than answers. Now more than ever, I find myself asking if dry bones can live again. I mean, when I attend to ever increasing forms of inequity that continue unabated, I have to ask, can these bones live? When I stare at a pandemic whose deadly variants gallop unhindered through every letter of the Greek alphabet, I have to ask, can these bones live? When I look at the suspicion and derision with which church, society, and university view each other, sometimes I have to ask if the bones can live again. No matter how badly I wish I had the answer, not one situation would be helped by my false confidence. I don't know what's going to happen with COVID. I don't know what's going to happen in Afghanistan. I don't know what's going to go down in this quad during this new school year. And I'm all right with that because I'm trying to be like Ezekiel to stop pretending like I have answers that I don't. Instead, I think we all might participate in what the writer of Ephesians called the fellowship, the fellowship of the mystery, because that's a prophetic community, one that's willing to endure uncertainty. I'm glad now that Ezekiel modeled this for us because his willingness to endure the uncertain made him able to hear what else God had to say about these bones. This is a div school crowd, so I don't have to tell you about the divine's second instruction to, to prophesy to the bones, to tell them that breath would enter them, that, that skin would cover them, that flesh would adhere to them, that they would come back together again. Nor do I have to tell you about all that happened when Ezekiel said what God said to say. You know then that there was rattling and that there was some shaking. And then, you know, the toe bone connects to the foot bone and the foot bone to the heel bone and the heel bone to the ankle bone and the ankle bone to the shin bone until till the whole frame comes back together. All this marvelous convocation happens on the valley floor, but there was a problem. There was no breath in the bone. Imagine being Ezekiel, being taken up and carried out and set out in an open air mass grave, playing your part in a gruesome drama only to become an agent of prophetic failure. Now, maybe that sounds a bit too harsh, but I'm in the text because if you read verses six and seven, you see that the first and last part of Ezekiel's first prophecy was that breath would enter the bones. Before God promises the reconstitution of bones and flesh and skin, God guarantees that these corpses will be able to breathe. Yet when Ezekiel speaks God's words to these bones, no breath appears in them. Thus, Ezekiel's prophecy is in part a failure. Ezekiel's miraculous work, it was unfinished. But in order to build prophetic community, after encountering the ugly and enduring the uncertainty, he had to embrace the unfinished. Instead of turning away from these half-dead bodies, he had to repeat the thing that had failed him. He had to prophesy again. Instead of forsaking his prophetic endeavor, Ezekiel had to embrace the unfinished. If I'm, un if I'm honest about it today, I'm kind of glad that Ezekiel failed because from time to time I have failed too and if this community is going to trek toward new life then we should expect to have to pass through failure along the way failure happens whenever you purpose to do a hard thing and that's why it's important to embrace the unfinished because embracing the unfinished helps you discover that there is life on the other side of failure. I said there's life on the other side of failure. Now I know that that sounds easier said than done because the unfinished is, is a troublesome category. Unfinished things raise feelings of frustration, feelings of disappointment, feelings of failure. Unfinished things are 
easy to ignore, to despise, to deny the unfinished. That's what confronts Ezekiel in the vision. Because the bones were together and the flesh was with them and the skin, but they had no breath. Ezekiel had done what God said to do. He had said what God said to say, but there was no breath in the bones. I can empathize with Brother Ezekiel here, and I bet some of you can too, because I have too on occasion felt bamboozled by God. Sometimes I felt misled by the Almighty, cheated by the call. Now, before you label me a, a heretic, hear me out. From time to time, as I've had to face my own unfinishedness, I've had to say, God, if I knew how hard this would be, I would never have started down this path. If I knew how low I would occasionally sink, I would never have enlisted in this effort. If I knew how much it would cost me, I would never have given you my yes. I mean, why keep trying when your trying keeps failing, when you're too close to quit and too far to celebrate, when you've made too much progress to turn around but face too many obstacles to go on? Yeah, I can empathize with Ezekiel. But that's not all. I can empathize with the bones, too, who, having moved so far on the way from death to life, still have to face reality that they are not there yet. But these bones, they got something to teach us today. That, that is, no, you're not there yet. But don't let there make you disrespect here. Because it took a lot to get here. It took a lot of studying and striving and struggling, it took a lot of working and wrestling and waiting, a lot of praying and, and pushing and, and persisting to get here. No, no, here is not there, but you can't get there without here. That's what the prophet learns in the vision. When he embraces the unfinished, he gets a second kind of instruction. This time, prophesy to the wind to the breath, tell it to come and breathe on these half living souls so they might really become a living army. And this time, when, when Ezekiel raised his voice, doing what had not worked before, breath and life came back into the bones. And these bones became a living, breathing army. Know now this great army, it could not have been the same as it was before its long ordeal. No, no, as these bones came back together, they had acquired new purpose, new clarity, and new power. Filled with a new spirit, this living army had become a prophetic community. Indeed, it was the spirit, the wind, the breath that drew all the vision's characters together. Because God and Ezekiel, the wind, and the bones, they all had a part to play. And the breath is what drew them together. Here we stand, students and staff, faculty and administration. We've all got a part to play. And breath can bring us together. In this text, as in life, the miracle is in the breath. Because breathing is always a miracle. From, from a baby's first breath to their parents' last breath. Breathing is always miraculous, a, a complex process that works to stabilize the, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and oxygen in, in our arterial blood. Breathing then is inherently ecological, a reminder that we can't survive on our own. So that's my closing exhortation for this year. Breathe. If, 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 if you're worried about what these next weeks and months might hold, breathe. If you're confused about the many detours that dot the path to your destination, breathe. If, like me, you feel that you're starting a new year on an empty tank, just breathe. Inhale and exhale. Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in cooperation and breathe out competition. Breathe in confidence and breathe out imposter syndrome. Breathe in humility and breathe out haughtiness. Breathe in curiosity and breathe out conceit. Breathe in fortitude and breathe out fragility. Breathe in imagination and breathe out disinterest. Breathe in introspection and breathe out 
projection. Just, just breathe. Breathe. But, but this is not all the breath we need. For we also need the breath that blew in the text. The wind, the spirit, the power that enabled these dry bones to become a living, breathing army. Because the task before us is spirit work. Encountering the ugly, that, that's spirit work. Enduring uncertainty, that's spirit work. Embracing the unfinished, that, that's spirit work. And that's going to require us to be endowed with the spirit and the breath of the Lord. My friend Richard Smallwood is right. We do need the power of the Holy Spirit. So we pray, send your anointing and let it fall down. Fall down on me. For when the spirit falls down, when we encounter ugliness and endure uncertainty and embrace the unfinished, then we will become a prophetic community. So now, let's get to it. I think it would be very hard to deliver a more fitting address for this year than the one we've just heard. We will count some bones this year. The university has a conference scheduled for October 28th through 30th on Yale and slavery. In the following week, we will talk about YDS and racism. All of this will be communicated to you well in advance multiple times. There will be pain. We'll have to deal with our failures, and we'll undoubtedly stumble along the way, but I hope that we will remember this message and remember that we need to breathe as we have been charged to breathe and work together to be a new community. We don't want to send you home without some sustenance. We can't have a reception, which is our tradition, but there are beverages. Uh, for you. There is not only, and on this side as well, uh, back over here, there are, uh, there's water. I think there's some soda. There is also some beer. Please take what you'd like. We can't mingle all of us together. I'm sorry. We'll get there. Uh, but we wish you the very best for this year. I now call on Professor Lapine to dismiss us. I ask if you would please Stay where you're at until the faculty makes their way out. Thank you. Let us pray. God, our mother and father, a new academic year has broken. And mixed in with our anticipation, we feel very and fear. Long time finds its end in which faculty and students could not meet in person. We have become images on the screen, disembodied and distant from each other. Now as the new year brings us together again in person, be with us as we attempt the first steps toward this. We take them knowing that COVID-19 has not yet lost all its horrors. There are the remembrances of those who have died. There's the pain of those who suffer from long COVID. There's the, the fear of those who cannot be vaccinated themselves or whose children are too young to receive protection. Be with them all in these sorrowful times. Let the light of your life shine up on them. Let them breathe. We study as a community here at YDS, a prophetic community. Let us experience and pass on peace and justice here in the court and give them both to those who suffer from war, natural disaster, and injustice. Those who experience the horrors of war in the US and Afghanistan. Those who experience the violence of nature as in Haiti and Louisiana. Those who, right here in our neighborhoods, to experience the people 
who are equal before you, still too often are treated unequally among human beings. Make us, being messengers who announce your peace to this world, and help us, discovering the traces of this peace by our common learning, that those who teach listen to the students, and that let those who study open their minds and hearts to new thoughts and challenges. Let us advance together in thy knowledge. So bless and keep us, the Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.